Our sermon text for today is the gospel lesson for the circumcision of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is the festival of the circumcision of our Lord Jesus Christ. For according to the law of Moses, every Israelite male was circumcised on the eighth day. If our Lord was born on December 25th, then today, January 1st, is the eighth day of his birth. In Exodus chapter 4, we read about Moses in the land of Midian, how after the Lord had appeared to him in the burning bush, he prepared his family to depart for Egypt. On the way, God sought to kill Moses because he had failed to circumcise his son who had been born in Midian. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, a faithful woman, quickly circumcised their son, and cast the foreskin at Moses' feet, declaring, You are a husband of blood to me. And in this way, she saved Moses' life. This episode in the life of Moses teaches us two things. First, it teaches the deadly weight of the law. Everyone born under the law is bound to keep the law perfectly, or else die, even as God was ready to kill Moses for disobeying the law of circumcision. Second, it teaches that no one keeps the law. If even Moses, that great prophet of the Old Testament, whom God calls the most humble man on earth, and to whom God spoke face to face, if this Moses was not able to keep the law, what hope do we have? Therefore, we are all deserving of death. And it is only on account of God's infinite mercy that any man lives another moment. That divine mercy of God has been manifested in today's gospel text. It is the shortest gospel in the lectionary, yet it contains all the richness of the gospel of salvation. Two things happen to the Christ in this text. He is circumcised, and he is given the name Jesus. When the Christ was circumcised according to the law, he became subject to the law. The Son of God took the deadly weight of the law upon his own shoulders. Now we, who are born in sin and under the law, have no choice. But he took up the law of his own free will so that he might carry the terrible burden for us. And he received the name Jesus, which means salvation. By this name, we know that he took up the weight of the law, not on a whim or merely to show off his power and perfection but to save us. 
who are too weak to carry the burden of the law. In this way, the circumcision of our Lord is a necessary part of our salvation. He took upon himself the deadly weight of the law, and in so doing, he received our punishment. He took upon himself our guilt, and he sheltered us from God's anger. Instead of punishment, he gives peace. Instead of guilt, forgiveness. Instead of fear, joy. For this is what St. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 4. When the fullness of time had come, that is, the time appointed by the Father from eternity, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. In order to save us, who are trapped under the impossible weight of the law, the Son of God became born of a virgin, so that he might be a man. And then he was circumcised, so that he might be under the law. Again, St. Paul writes to the Philippians, saying that the Christ, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That is, the Christ is equal with God by nature. But, continues St. Paul, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. In other words, the Christ, being eternal God, the Son of the Father, is by nature above the law. Now, for clarification, in human language, when we say someone is above the law, we mean that they break the law as often as they please. This is not so with the Christ. He is above the law in the sense that he is the author of the law. The law itself is an expression of his own nature. It is as impossible for the Christ to break the law as it is for God to lie. And to prove this, our Savior put himself under his own law and did so by circumcision and showed by his perfect life that he is the perfection of the law. Now, we are baptized into the Christ, and he has become our perfection. As St. Paul explains in Romans chapter 6, where he says that we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So since the Christ is perfect, and we are in the Christ, God the Father treats us, on account of faith, as though the perfection were our own, notwithstanding our sinful condition. This offers not only the assurance of heavenly salvation, 
but also great comfort in daily living. What we have in Christ is not merely the bare forgiveness of sins, as though God gave a clean record and a chance to try again. Forgiveness is not about second chances. If it were, we would fail just as shamefully the second time. Only we would earn greater punishment for failing twice and wasting God's mercy. True forgiveness is more than this. What we have in Christ is the promise that the weight of the law is lifted, that we do not need second chances, because the law is already fulfilled. Christ kept the law. Therefore, we do not try to earn God's favor by works of the law. God's favor is already ours. We know full well that every day is a chain of countless mistakes and bad decisions. We sometimes fear to do what we should because... Either while we do it, we sin, or because we do it for sinful reasons. Living in this sinful flesh means sinning no matter what. If we do the wrong thing, we sin. If we do the right thing, we sin while doing it, or we do it for sinful reasons. That is the burden of the law, and what it means to be a slave to sin. The freedom of the gospel, then, is that in Christ we are already redeemed, even before we do the wrong thing. This is what Luther means when he says, sin boldly and fall on grace. He is not advocating willful sin. He is giving practical advice. As though to say, if you're going to sin anyway, do the best you can trusting that God will pardon the rest for the Christ's sake. So he who lives out his daily vocation, trusting that he is redeemed, not by his own efforts, but by those of the Christ, is already redeemed in all he does. However, this doctrine is not an excuse to neglect the law. As St. Paul says, How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Since the Christ has taken away the weight of the law, we should keep the law gladly and out of thanksgiving rather than out of fear. Christians ought to be the first at living moral lives, not to work salvation, but out of love for the Christ. Christians should teach the Ten Commandments to their children, expound upon them, and apply them to daily life. Because that is what Christians do. But if anyone neglects 
or willfully rebels against the commandments, it is to be feared that he has fallen from the faith. For St. Paul writes to Titus that Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Elsewhere, however, St. Paul says of those who are damned, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Thus, obedience to the law, although it does not save us, is a natural expression of faith. For we all produce works, either good works, which flow from true faith, or wicked works, which flow from sin. Even the Christian stumbles. Even Moses failed to keep the whole law. For the burden of the law is too great for man to bear. Therefore, the Son of God, the author of the law, became man and subjected himself to circumcision that he might live as one under the law. Having kept the law perfectly, he relieved us from the burden of the law that we might be saved by faith apart from the law. Now he calls us to keep the law out of thanksgiving as his redeemed children, trusting that even when we fail, he is still our redeemer and we are forgiven. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.